Hey y'all, this is Dr. Rich Massey here in Austin again. Just been filming a couple of shows with Meridian. And uh, I'm gonna show you a corny joke on this show. We have to name each show. So the overall shows are gonna be called Awakening Health. This episode is gonna be called something based on a corny joke that just came to my mind one day. Um, so let me show you this. This is from my old coin collection book. Back in the day, huh? Uh, mercury dimes, right? I got these out for the show and they're all so tarnished, right? So I, I just wanted you to know all the dimes will be tarnished because they actually had real silver in them. Um, so gosh, this, this little booklet here is probably worth 20 or 30 bucks now. Back in the day it was just a few dimes, right? Um, so, and those were between 1916-1945 uh, so I picked two that I had. One is from 1941, the year my dad graduated high school, and one's from 1945, the year my mom graduated high school. So those have family meanings for me. All right, so here's the corny joke. So you watch right. this, watch this. What did y'all just see? Anybody? All right, everybody's saying they saw two dimes move. What you just saw is called a paradigm shift. <laughs> I told you it was a bad joke, right? Okay, all right. So today's show is a paradigm shift for most of us who are in the health field, right? Uh, we were taught just the opposite. So. Um, Remember before we showed you the big book from Dr. Hammer? I think we took the did we do the we took the whole chart out. Yeah. Showed how he figured out all these brain areas that happen and how there's a part of the brain that operates every part of the body, right? And does it on purpose in service to us, in service to our survival. Okay. So let's see how that's a paradigm shift, huh? How the Germanic new medicine led to all these new developments. Okay, the automatic brain, the part that runs every part of our body, is always right. So let me give you the basic example, the one that helps me the most. If I were to shine a light in any of y'all's eyes, what does the pupil of your eye do? If you shine a light in the eye, it gets really, really tiny right? Because it tries to keep out bright sunshine. So if you were to walk out into a hot desert sun, it's going to close down so that sun doesn't burn the back of your eyeball, right? If you or I walk into a dark room, it gets really big. If we're in a normal amount of light, it's just a normal size. So let me ask you this. Have you ever gone outside on a sunny day and heard your brain say, oh my gosh, is it big or little? Wait a minute. Oh, which one do I do? Yeah. See, I've never heard that either. The automatic brain is always right. It always remembers what to do just like that. Because if I don't have this the right size, I might not see the saber-toothed tiger that ate my great-great-great-great-grandpa or the bus that's about to run over me because the light's too bright and I can't see it, right? So the automatic brain has to do this stuff instantly. It has to do it correctly. Now most of us kind of knew this, you know? We knew that it was triggered by light. Emotions will do it too, right? If you watch somebody's eyes in a movie, I don't know how they do this part. They must be really good actors. So like when somebody looks into someone's eyes and they're supposed to be in love with that person, actually see their pupils dilate a little bit, right? You kind of want to let in more of that person, right? You know that feeling? Yeah. So emotions will do it. And here's a big one here, drugs, All right? So when the cops pull somebody over and they start shining that light in their eye, what are they looking for? They're looking for something that doesn't behave like that, right? Because that can be a sign that if the person's looking at an officer of the law, they're probably not in love, right? 
yeah, if it's not working right, there's probably some drugs on board, right? So this is so reliable that it can decide whether somebody even is allowed to be free or not. If they're going to go in cuffs or get to go back home, right? So the automatic brain is always right. It's always operating these things exactly right. Unless you're on prescription drugs, uh, some street drugs. The nice thing is if you go to an eye doctor, they can give you a drug that'll make it like this on purpose so they can see the back of your eye. But they have to be real careful and protect your eye when you leave. Because if they leave it like this and you walk out in the sunshine, the back of your eyeball will burn. That's a bad thing, right? So every single drug poisons the automatic brain. Some do it a lot, some do it a little bit. So you only want to use a prescription drug for a short period of time because they're all poisonous. They all make it to where this part that runs our body perfectly is a little off balance, right? Blood pressure drugs do it, heart drugs do it, cancer drugs do it, Smoking does it, drinking does it, all of these things, right? They throw, they throw this automatic brain off a little bit. Okay, so here we are. The automatic brain's always right. It's always in the service of survival, helping us live, okay? What I didn't really put together, and I'd been to pharmacy school first, our main textbook was a book of how every single drug poisons which part of the automatic brain but it's talked about in such a way. So listen to this sentence, see if it doesn't put you to sleep. And this class of drugs has a mild effect on the beta-2 receptor that is inhibitory in nature. Uh, you know, like, okay, which thing do I circle to pass the test? It's different than coming out and saying, this will poison your brain. It's gonna poison the part of your brain that does this, you know? It has a different impact for me. It, you know, it, it was it hidden for me. I didn't get it, right? I'm starting to get it now. Okay. So, it turns out that every single part of the body is regulated just like the eyeball. So, if this automatic brain can make my pupil big, and that's a good idea, it can also start a healing program down in my body that we call cancer and scare everybody. It's no different than changing the size of the eyeball. Isn't that strange? And yet, everybody's so afraid. Okay, here's another one, breathing tubes. Anybody around here have asthma, heard of asthma, know what that is, bronchitis? Right. The size of the breathing tubes is the same thing as the size of the pupil of the eye. The automatic brain runs that. Like if you and I go outside, there's something nasty in the air, we'll shut this down and try not to take as much of it in, right? Might cough a little around that. Do we have to think about that? Do we have to go, hmm, let me see. I think there's something noxious in the air. I think I'll close down my airways a little bit, protect myself. We don't have to think about that. We'd, we'd go nuts if we had to think of every single thing, right? Happens automatically and it's always perfect. Interestingly, Guess what the biggest thing is that affects the size of the breathing tubes? How much argument there is in a family. How much argument there is at work. That is the biggest factor for closing this down because this brain sees air is what keeps me alive. If I've got a bunch of arguing going on in the house, my brain will actually open my breathing tubes so I can keep more of my own air and you can't get it, right? That's kind of how that works. Okay, then this next one, blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if y'all need to adjust something, help yourselves. Okay, so then we look at blood vessels and I put, I put three different blood vessel areas here. So this one we all know, right? Blood vessels in the skin. If I go outside on a cold day, what do the blood vessels of my skin do? They get really tiny so that I hold in all the heat. If the blood vessels in the skin got really big when I went out in the cold, I would lose all my heat and I would freeze to death, right? So the brain does this automatically. But here's the big one, the number one killer, right? 
heart disease. What regulates the blood vessels of the heart? What makes it change like the pupils of the eye? What makes the blood vessels in the heart big with lots of blood flow? What makes it tiny? What makes it normal? Does anybody know what that is? It's real simple. You've all seen it on all the wildlife shows on TV, right? If you've ever watched any documentaries of bighorn sheep or lions fighting over who's going to get all the women, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Fighting for territory. So if I'm fighting for territory, my brain will automatically make the blood vessels in my heart really big. So my heart has so much blood that I can fight for a longer time for my territory. If I fight long enough, nine months is the usual period, which is interesting, same length of time that a baby's in the womb. If the fight for territory lasts more than nine months, say I'm fighting with the IRS or fighting with the, the medical board over my license, medical license or something, and it lasts over nine months, like mine lasted two years, but who's counting? <laughs> I've totally forgotten, right? Okay, so it keeps those arteries really big. When the fight is over, whether I win or lose, or just in my heart, I give it all to God and say, I can't do it anymore, right? When the fight is over for me, the arteries close down for repair. They get really, really small for about two weeks after the fight is over. This is when people have heart attacks. This is also when animals have heart attacks. Interestingly, Dr. Hammer, our German guy here, he cut dog's chest open took a clamp and clamped off the big, one of the big arteries in the heart. Now, what are you and I told happens that causes a heart attack? We get a clot that blocks off one of those big arteries, right? It closes it off and bam, we've got a heart attack. Guess what he found when he took a dog and clamped off an artery? It went from totally open to totally closed, like right now. Did the dog have a heart attack? Nope. Closed him back up. He took angiograms every week for three months. Within three months, the dog had grown whole new blood vessels. He just took it easy for a few weeks and then was totally back to normal. No heart muscle damage. He opened the dog up again and clamped off the second artery. No heart attack. No heart muscle damage. Three months later, cut it open again and clamped off the third and final artery. That's crazy, isn't it? No heart attack, no heart damage, but you can take the same dog and let it be in its territory and then put it in a cage and make it watch a new dog take over its territory and it will chew at that cage. It'll try to get out and fight for the territory, but it can't get out and it fights and fights and fights. When it finally gives up, when it finally gives up the fight and its arteries are closing down, if you take the new dog away, open the cage and let the old dog go out and have his territory again, he'll be dead within the next few days of a massive heart attack. You can clamp the arteries off, nothing happens. Put him in a place where there's a fight for territory, dead, of a heart attack. Isn't that interesting? It makes you wonder what are we doing with our thinking here when this kind of science is out there and you can see when we have people come in here I'll, sh I'll show you one. Um, I'll have to demonstrate it without the chairs. So typically we have two chairs that are the same so this is a woman I've known since childhood. She has chest pain, right? Means her little arteries are spasming and getting small. She feels pain in her chest. We sorted out who it was that she's most upset with in life. And it's from something that happened a long time ago. In fact, it's something that happened in her family before she was born. 
her automatic brain still has it stored in there. We store stuff for at least three generations, okay? And it was a doctor who made a mistake that cost her grandmother her life when her mom was a little girl, okay? Now here she is, the third generation down. She gets chest pain around certain doctors, okay? So we sat her in the chair. She was having chest pain. We asked her to picture this doctor in the chair. Just imagine it. She imagines that doctor. The chest pain gets worse. We scoot the chair closer. Oh boy, it's getting really bad. Then we tricked her. This is a trick I learned from a guy named Hal Robinson in Kerrville. God bless you, Hal, you know? So I said real quick without thinking about it, go sit in that chair and be that doctor. She went over and sat in the chair where she imagined the doctor that she was angry with and the chest pain disappeared. That happens reliably. Whatever you have, if there's an enemy associated with it, somebody that I see as an enemy, and here was a guy who took some of her territory, her grandmother, right? In her mind, that's how it was coded. You never know how people code things, right? If they code it as a drama, they're gonna get lung cancer or pneumonia or tuberculosis, something in the lungs. But if it's coded as territory in the automatic brain, it's gonna show up in the heart. That's what makes the heart blood vessels change just like the pupils of the eye, right? So this country has a lot of heart disease. This country is based on territory. I mean, look at our history. We lie for territory. <laughs> we kill for territory. We genocide for territory. Everything is territory. My portfolio, my investments, my property, my this, my that. And if there's anything that comes up that threatens that, it's the heart arteries that tell that story. And the automatic brain's just trying to help us. It's wanting to go bighorn sheep with the IRS. We don't know that's what it's doing, but it's like, okay, we're going to take them, you know. And same thing with the medical board or whoever it is or whatever it is, right? So the thing to do is find some solution for this. Either when we give up the fight or it's over, we need to rest for two weeks while these arteries repair themselves. Then they'll come back to normal and we'll be fine. There's a whole long list of guys who died in the two weeks after winning their big lawsuit. They'd been working on it for more than nine months. They finally won. They didn't know that after the fight's over, the arteries closed down halfway for repair. So they go out and celebrate with their friends, right? The heart needs a lot of blood flow if you're going to go out and celebrate the way some people do. And those arteries aren't big enough to support that. Boom, dead of a heart attack, right? Another choice is really authentically give that to God or whoever it belongs to. Hey, I'm just a steward of this. This really doesn't belong to me, right? Um, and once we hand that over, got to rest for two weeks because the arteries are going to get small for a couple of weeks while they repair, okay? So that's, that's basically the thing with the heart, and we'll say more about that later. The brain, ah, the brain, huh? We all want more blood flow to the brain, right? We want to go around with big, smart brains, putting everything together, right? Guess what makes the blood vessels of the brain be normal, big, or small? Intellectual territory. So the last person I saw who had had a stroke, it was an argument she had with some friends about, they were from another country, they came over to see a certain style of church service that they had heard happens in the United States. And they wanted to go to where this really famous name preacher was, but she knew they would hate it. She had already picked out another place for them. But she could not persuade them to go to the place that she picked. 
they were set on going to where this big name guy was, right? So intellectually, she could not come up with the right words or a persuasive enough argument to secure her territory intellectually. She couldn't make them agree. They were in the parking lot after the church service and the people said, this was really terrible. We should have gone to the place that you said. And all of a sudden she couldn't see. She went numb, fell on the, the fight was over. The intellectual fight was over. She had won in a way, she had lost in a way, but her little vessel shut down for repair because she'd been worrying about this for a long time and arguing about it for a long time, right? So that's what happens with a stroke. Interestingly, we took the age that she was when it happened and the automatic brain works in cycles. We're going to talk about that. I said, what happened at half that age? At half that age, there was a divorce from her first husband and an argument over what to do with the children. She could not convince him to go along with what she thought, and he got his way. We went all the way back to when she was four years old by going half and half and half, and the first earliest one she could remember was arguing with her parents about her first haircut. She had seen something in a magazine or her friends and she wanted it cut a certain way and her parents said no and she could not convince them. And she was heartbroken that they cut her hair the way they wanted to instead of the way she wanted. And so double that age from 4 to 8 to 16, 32 and 64, she had a big crisis every time about intellectual territory. When she finally saw that pattern, she was able to just hand all that back to God. That's the kind of person she was. That's the solution she went for. I get it. I was not put into this world to get my way. <laughs> I, was, I was put here to love people. And so she just decided to love people, even though they're all wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're going to love them anyway, right? So, and that, that's working for her, right? So she's totally recovered from the stroke. I think everybody's got this. The automatic brain runs every part of the body. It runs all the ducts in the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the kidneys, all the blood vessels everywhere. It runs all of these things. If we have something showing up in our body, our automatic brain is doing that on purpose to help us survive. If I have a cancer in my liver, my automatic brain did that to help me survive. We're going to talk about how that works. I don't have to believe my body betrayed me. That would be silly, like going outside telling my body, you done me wrong. You made, made the pupils the wrong size. You know, it's like, ah. So, so here we are. We've come along, got this huge medical industry. It's kind of intimidating. Most of us are born in the hospital. We heard doctors being, you know, venerated, you know, from the time we were in the womb. So we see these big ads and all these guys in white coats, which I've done some of that, right? And it's a little bit intimidating, right? Somebody goes in to take their child for vaccinations, and boy, they're told all kinds of things. Here's a young mother. She doesn't have a medical degree. What's she supposed to believe? Really important-looking people with all kinds of papers. Oh, your kid's not safe if you don't do this. You can't trust your body. Well, we trust our body all the time when we walk in and out of the light. How is it any different, right? It turns out it's exactly the same. The body always knows what to do. As we saw before, um, and I'd showed you all the healing. We didn't get to it today. But remember from the first shows, the body is always healing. Always healing. Just the opposite of what we're told. We don't get a disease that, oh, it's so scary for our body. Our body's doing all that stuff on purpose, okay? So we can trust that. Then next time we're going to talk about, uh, let's see, what's our preview for next time? Assuming nothing mysterious happens to me before next show <laughs> for some of those comments. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of the timelines, and we're going to talk about some of the generational stuff that's kind of cool, okay? So please come back next week. If you ever get a chance to take a class with him in Recall Healing, when you watch this guy impersonate the automatic brain and work with somebody, 
you finally kind of get it, how fiercely this automatic brain loves us and takes care of us and cares about our survival, right? This is a great book to get. As I told you, I use it in conjunction with this EM wave from HeartMath. I put that little thing on my ear. I look up asthma, heart disease, whatever is going on, a, you know, a lump on my underarm. And I, I read what's in here and I see what this little M wave says and I get to find out what does my automatic brain think it's saving me from? What can I do to convince it that I don't, I don't need a lump in my underarm? <laughs> You know, what story is this about and how can we negotiate? It's all about conversations, right? So we want to have a real conversation, not a medical oriented conversation with our body. Um, yeah, so we're down to like one minute or less. Huh? Yeah, so we could, we could probably stop there and let everybody go get popcorn sooner. All right, I'll see you all again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Do I have... Ah, okay. So thanks for joining me this week. And uh, if you want to look us up on Awakening Health website, um, we'd be happy to visit with you. And uh, I also have a phone number. It's 830-992-1143 if you have a question for me. And uh, hopefully we'll have a conversation that uh, shifts something for both of us. So see you next time.